now that we're in part two, I want to offer a bit of a, eh, not a challenge. I mean, heck, anything's a challenge. It's the drink water challenge. It's the don't take a challenge challenge, and no one can win that, right? I'm going to narrate what I wrote uh, the day after we made up this town in one of the past broadcasts. If you're watching this on YouTube, you'll find a link for that in the description. Um, but if you want, listen to the music, close your eyes, and I will narrate where we as DMs now. Remember, we're, we're DMs. We have, our, we have our big boy DM headphones on uh, to help get in the mood to listen to music. Uh, I invited three people to my Discord, and I have one voice channel with only one space in it. They all tried to go in it and talk and found out it's only one person at a time in voice channel, and they hated me. <laughs> well, hopefully, uh, I, I don't know if I've succumbed to that, but I'm, I'm for setting up Discords, I'm a bit of a noob. Uh, I'm, I'm good at using them as a uh, on the other end of it. You just need a place to host some images that wasn't uh, Imager. I gotcha. Or Imger, I don't know. Jif or Gif. <laughs> so I, I will do my best to put on a, uh, a narrator's voice uh, in fact I can even I'll, I'll make my face disappear temporarily so that you all aren't dazzled by my, my natural uh, charisma here uh, let me find here we go If you follow the Suntrack Road setward through the greater grasslands, you'll find yourself facing a very developed city, nestled in a rather untamed region. As odd as it may seem at first, how this city came to be quickly materializes before you as you look south to Kite Lake and see many litters, or lake shipping boats, that come and go from its port. Welcome to Klabheim, a city of trades, guilds, and the prosperity and tragedy that follow in the wake of such heightened activity left to itself in a remote frontier. Continuing setward from the city and extending south into the Kite are the Cloud Touches, or Cloud Touch Mountains. Old and overgrown, they were the natural home to native orcs who lived here before the Dragonborn found and established Klabheim. Working with and employing their vast strength, the woods Minerals and other resources were harvested, invested, and shipped back, uh, shipped back to the civilized lands riseward. Further setward is the Morgs Wood, an old-growth deciduous forest from which the true border to the lands around the trade city, and now the only source of wood available to the wildly growing boomtown. Beneath Kitta Lake are vast deposits of salt, a precious commodity back in the riseward lands. Using the passages and caverns under the old mountains and mines, salt is one of the major mine substances in the city-state's economy. There is a network of caverns, mines, and tunnels to explore that have only been expanded upon in the quest to extract natural wealth from the land. Standing on both sides of the mountain are a series of ten carved faces. Not even of orcish origin, at least not wholly, though some have been decorated by the native tribes as guardians. The Lock Idols are a mystery, and thankfully a benign one. The competition for money, minerals, and influence has brought conflict and struggle to the rich, uh, to the rich of Klabheim. The city's guilds, effectively its oligopoly rulers, are in open conflict for power. Commercial competition has bled over into the various faiths that have taken root in the city too. Shamanic orbs can, uh, conflict against the gods of hedonism and trade that inevitably set shop in places like this. Formal riseward religions try to keep a moral base among the populace, attracting the kind of hellfire and brimstone practitioners that can hope to compete with the other bold voices and cries of salvation and damnation alike. Competition is always key. Competition of, coi of coin, faith, labor. Proof of achievement is important to who you are here. Labor is ubiquitous. Fruits of labor is scarce. The city's many orphans are a by-blow of this mentality. Many parents are lost in the vast freshwater lake. Mines collapse. 
Wood collectors disappear in the woods. Smelting or other refining accidents are common. The term urchin here isn't so much an insult as a status or even a mark of citizenry. Half-orc children are more common here, given the natives of the land and how integrated they are into the labor foundation of the city. Since the orcs are native but tend to live outside the city more often than not, and humans are always coming and going, half-orcs are arguably the second most numerous race of permanent citizenry beneath the dragonborn. Perhaps despite all the trouble, turmoil, coin, and conflict lies the greatest threat, or even opportunity, that any of the city's ruling guilds could hope to find. A portal to another plane, buried deep under the city itself. And they all lived happily ever after the end. <laughs> uh, I missed a little bit of chat in that narration. But I just needed a place to host image. Okay, it says Imgur. I don't know how it is said. I just know Discord hosts all file types. So if I need to send files to someone, I can use it and not have to bother with emails. Yeah, uh, I tried the Discord. It did uh, PDFs, which is good because that's how we've been saving all our characters. And I tried sending or I tried uploading an MP3 of the end, end song for the channel. And, uh, and that seemed to work too. So... Any of you with uh, experience in that, or you have an idea of what you'd like to see in regards to a place to hang out that is flavored around what we do here, let me know. All right, so we have our story. We have our map. We spent over 9,000 hours in MS Paint to create this beautiful masterpiece. Um, I fully expect that Wizards of the Coast will be contacting me one day to do the next set of maps for their great adventure. <laughs> uh, we have an idea of the city. We know generally what goes on. Now, when we randomly rolled up this city and we are illustrating it and applying some other concepts, uh, we had an idea. This is just a flavorful way of being able to um, of being able to set that up as such. I think this can go. Goodbye. There's our party. Here's our city for reference. Now, something else that we should reference when we are storytelling is this right here. You're going to find it in a couple different forms. This is the heroic journey. This is the cycle that you know, almost every <laughs> almost every story follows. And, you know, not because it's lazy, but because this works, this create, it sets a good pace. This has been thematic, uh, in our history of storytelling. Oh, thank you, Gaboose. I'm glad that you think that's a good summation. Now, what we're doing is a bit of a blend of novel writing and campaign or storytelling for D&D. A campaign itself, I wish could work as neatly as this this graphic up here shows. Unfortunately, um, when you play D and D and you're the DM, you are also a person who's trying to herd cats. It it doesn't necessarily work. And all of you, you know, you could all your players could be best of friends, and you've you've known each other forever. You've been in the army together, or you were old college roommates, or something. And despite that, oh, we're back to the, the blacksmith shop. I forgot to, to take that out of the queue. There we go. Let's go back to the docks district. I, I'm in a watery mood. Um, it's like herding cats. It can be very difficult to get a nice, clean story like this going. We should try and keep this in mind with different rises and falls, um, and we'll do our best. Now, we have the convenience here that we're playing all five characters, and we're the PCs and the DM. So we get to have a little easier time of it. Uh, that's why I want to focus on the storytelling itself and not really sweat too many of the details. Or say, hey, by the way, we're going to write a, a novel. Which, I don't know, that could be interesting. Uh, November is uh, NaNoWriMo, uh, National uh, National Novel Writing Month. N-A, like capital N-A. Oh, anyway, I'll, I'll write it out. Um That might be a fun thing that we can do in this uh, in this channel for Nanorimo, is uh, maybe as a side project, 
we can get together and we can choose uh, one of the storylines that we've made up to this point and write it out as a novel together on stream. That could be a lot of fun. Something to think about. I thought it was more like herding rabid squirrels, yes. <laughs> you know, and, and you think that even... Uh, how much grief do the producers of Final Fantasy XIV get? And everything in there is... like It's a video game. Everything has to be scripted and done. And... Uh, how, how difficult is it to get people to try and even focus within a tighter set of boundaries than use your imagination? You don't have the normal world and supernatural world shown there. Um, yes. Uh, so Shadzar did bring up a good point. And um, there are other charts. Uh, this was the one that I, I chose because I, was, I wanted to focus more on the steps. But that's true about... Um, about here, cutting off uh, 11 and 2, going in a line, uh, everything above this is the normal world as we know it. Everything below this is the world that we do not know. It's a supernatural world, or it's the world that we thought we knew, but it turns out it's not that way for one reason or another. I think 14 Story is really very good for an MMO. I do agree. Uh, that was one of the reasons why I liked Eleven so much when I played it too. It was very, it was a very well written story in my opinion. I mean, we'll we'll leave you know mechanics or anything off to the side. The story was really good, especially for an MMO. Uh, ba ba do. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, Shad. You also said from the 1949 book that was. Uh, uh, you're, you're you're talking about the one that describes the the hero's journey. Uh, what's the name? I forget offhand, but anyway, so we, a general story has these parts or some people will call it act one, act two, a act two B, and then act three. If you want to break it up that way, if more of a, a not, not necessarily a poetic, uh, more of a dramatic, uh, storytelling is your, your flavor. So this is good reference. Um, something to, to consider, but like all good adventures, we need to start off with, um, as a DM, the, we're not, I'm not writing out the entire module here. I'm going to be making a, an outline and then we can, we can put a little meat on the bones of the outline as we go through it, but we need to hit certain steps in order to make sure we're spotlighting characters and that we are providing, the ability of a lot of interaction and challenges. Because as a DM, you don't just want to narrate to your players, because then why did they even create characters? They'll all just get audible accounts and can listen to books or something. Um, that too, if your party isn't built for an all combat all the time, you know, frontline war situation, you want to make sure you have a mix. And even then, do you, do you only want to fight monsters or do you want to throw in some traps and hazards? So we want to make sure we're mixing it up some. Seo says, I usually take a week off work for a new expansion in 14 so I can take my time with the story and not feel like I'm falling behind with anything. Uh, I agree, and in my own sentiment, especially because I have a hard drive filled with uh, videos that I've been... Pro um, <laughs> videos of my playthrough, that's another part of my YouTube channel. Um, I, I know what you're saying. <laughs> I'll tell you, though... Uh, I was a little sad when Microsoft Movie Maker uh, wasn't available when I got my new computer... Uh, but I've learned how to use uh, another program called Power Director, and um, I feel that my, my quality's gone up. Like I, I've leveled up as a person a little bit more <laughs> for learning how to do something new. All right, so anyway, as a DM, one of the first things we have to do is uh, describe the setting to our party. In so doing, we're filling ourselves, we're loading the map ourselves so that we can answer questions uh, should the PCs have any. We already did this part. I don't need to narrate it again for you. I will if you think I have a charming voice, but I'll do that after we're done recording. <laughs> after we describe the setting, uh, we describe what our party is doing. Based on us as PCs and what we had um, offered to our DM here, it looks like we can use a base of operations. Um, the base is going to be uh, Lux's uh, upstart 
uh, Lux's Upstart Shrine. We have someone who's new into town. You know, he's a good guy. He wants to network. And he can... Uh, I, I'm, I'm just seeing that uh, he would eventually get networked in with Jermaine. So while Rin is kind of the linchpin of all the characters, we would open up... Uh, not necessarily with an in media res, which is sort of like you open up with an action sequence and no one knows what's going on, but you watch because there's uh, explosions and whatnot. Uh, so we, we base this out of Lux's Upstart Shrine and we can introduce Jermaine here. Oh, Shadzar says, the smell of filth filled the air and you disembarked your ship. You would be happy to get a bath away from that crew, but by the looks of things, you ended up someplace not much better. The worn planks of the pier where your ship is moored. Oh, uh, yeah, you know, they, then they they creak like your grandfather's back or something like that. <laughs> Very good. I like that, Shad. Uh, Lux's Upstart Shrine. Uh, we introduced Jermaine. Uh, we can have a little bit of a back and forth, like a character introduction, uh, where you talk to the PC playing Lux. And, uh, and, and, you know, and Jermaine, Jermaine comes in and says, oh, you know, you've been looking for me. And then they introduce themselves to each other as characters. Um, well then, uh, Jermaine will know Rin. Rin will know Falco. And then as far as Bombada goes, um... We can we can do this several ways. One of the other characters, like uh, Jermaine, because she's a face in the city. Uh, Jermaine might know Bombada, though, because uh, he's kind of reclusive. Um, or we could even say that uh, Bombada has come to the shrine. Whoop! The Shirne. <laughs> Hearing of a follower of light. And seeks supplies, right? Uh, so the the light cleric gets a lot of fire and producing light and things along these lines. Um, so we have a foreigner from another land who might have brought with him various powders and, and metals. I think like fireworks. How do they get color in the fireworks? It's different metals as they as they uh, burn and oxidize. So he might have come down from the monastery during this time in order to. Uh, try and investigate this new shrine and see if it can supply him what he needs. And then he ends up meeting these other characters. Uh, yeah, Bombada uh, is, uh, th that is uh, Brother Cousins, as uh, as you had uh, mentioned, Shad. Our, our blaster monk, yeah. <laughs> so there's our base and there's our introduction. Um in some way, we've offered the ability for everyone to get to know each other, um, at least conceptually. This occurs, and this could take one whole session even. You know, uh, you travel, and this is a way for you to also introduce the city as the, as the, the people go back and forth um, to meet each other and to see the, these resources. We have, uh, we have the young cleric, who is the newcomer, and everyone else has been around the area for a while. And so you get to narrate through the eyes and mouth of, um, of uh, Feralando because he's the newcomer and everyone else already knows this, but they're getting that experience as you're doing so. So then we need uh, to hook them together. And this could be something that uh, they would have in common. And this could even lead into how people meet Falco, because Falco is probably not going to want to set foot in the city. That's a part of his character. But he, he might be outside the city, as I said, fishing, or Falco could be hanging out in the mines. And so it just so happens that uh, while Lux may not have the, um, the, like the powdered minerals or metals, uh, he did hear that one of the substances that is mined uh, locally might have, uh, if he can go and examine it, he could determine if this could be, this powder could be rendered from the, the natural rocks. Well, everyone's going that way anyway. And so the hook, uh, they go to the mines to meet Falco 
and obtain some mineral samples. No one there is necessarily hostile towards each other. No one is there who's, you know, being... You haven't had to kidnap someone and leave a ransom note saying if you don't show up here at, at midnight with ten gold, then, you know, she's getting the knife or something. Um, so they head out there, and we have a chance in our in our mod, in our story. Now we can describe the countryside outside of the city. We're still in the known world, nothing about the farmlands and the, the plains and the, you know, the, the remnants of the forest, of the first forest on this side of the mountains that was harvested for the city, you know, to make all the litters and everything. Um, we can add those in and we could do a couple rolls. In fact, we could even have a, an encounter at this point, right? If we're starting off at well, we don't even have to start off at level one. If we go with what the baby character is, uh, that would be uh, Fairlando Luxador here. Uh, he's level four. We could start this off as a level four adventure and take it into, you know, ten levels from there if we really wanted to. Um, so they go to the mines and uh, we can have uh, an encounter along the way. It could be local monsters, uh, bandits. You can always throw bandits, just like you can always start in a tavern. <laughs> um, in a developed city like this, uh, though, things like pirates could exist on the lake. Uh, they look to try and take mineral shipments and intercept them. Um, you could even have rogue bands of orcs that don't want to integrate with society, who are kind of, um, you know, they're, they're trying to savage the city. And that could add for uh, you know a consideration for Falco too. He doesn't want people killed. He just doesn't want the city around. He doesn't like technology. He doesn't you know he's the long beard of the group, <laughs> kind of a thing. <laughs> so they have the hook. They're still in the real world. They're still in the known world. Um, and then we have uh, like their their first big conflict. And this doesn't even have to be versus a boss or a sub-boss of the boss. Uh, this is, they get to the mines and uh, they have to rescue miners from a collapsed tunnel. Right? Especially if we put an encounter along the way, they've already had combat. Now let's test their, their skills and their intelligence. Because look, this is a smart party. Besides Rin here... We have 14, 16, 14, and 15. They're going to be clever. And they're going to have to be clever because they don't have strength. So what are they going to do? Can they invent things? Is uh, by, by putting a challenge like this out here, does that mean that Rin can use her carpentry tools and that uh, Bombada can use his tinker tools? Um, things to think about. Because again, we want to feature different PCs and offer different challenges along the way as we're writing our, our story or our mod. Uh, so this could include they have to, you know, go through the mines and you know, produce light along the way. Don't get lost. You could really have another random encounter in a mine if you want. Like, a, I don't know, a swarm of bats or rats or something. You know, nothing that's going to kill them, but enough that it can raise the tension and maybe bleed off a spell or two so that if they get into a pinch at the end of the, the tunnel where the collapse is... Uh, they might not have all of the resources available, and they have to think it out. Uh, so here, uh, they uh, first big conflict, and then they can pardon uh, return home. Uh, they are effectively heroes, right? They they saved forty miners in the collapse. Uh, they're kind of bonded together. Uh, everyone knows the newcomer and p remembers the urchins, maybe. And even Falco, who is a known or unknown quantity, gets some level of notoriety. He may not like it, but he can still say, oh yeah, so the, the people have heard of me here. So return home as heroes, relatively bonded. This then puts some attention from maybe a patron of the city, uh, because remember, the guilds are all openly fighting, meaning that uh, fighting very rich guilds want to pay coin or to offer influence to people who will fight on their behalf. So maybe several sponsors uh, can come forward and, uh, and through Fairlando or through someone else say, well, here's, uh, here's three different guilds. We're DMs, right? Here's three different guilds. Each one is willing to sponsor you 
um, to continue to do good deeds around the city in order to provide reputation for yourself and subsequently them. And this then uh, has, it's a bit of a double-edged sword because uh, it's a way for you to advance the party, or if we're PCs, we know that we'll advance through it, but uh, we're twisting that, uh, maybe I'll, I'll call it a double-edged dagger, we're twisting the dagger, right? Because this is a mortal version of what Germaine went through when she sold herself to the fiend below the city. She was offered a patron who offered her gifts and notoriety and money. And so here she is, yet she's this lawful good face of the city. She wants to run this orphanage. So of course she wants to earn you know favor from one of the guilds. I mean, there's not necessarily an orphan guild. I, I presume not anyway. Um, you know, unless we're kind of getting into some weird, like, child labor <laughs> kind of a thing. Uh, you know, then all of a sudden we're kind of in the, you know, 1800s, maybe 1700s kind of a situation. Uh, with an industrial revolution style, uh, stereotype. But anyway, so that her player, like, uh, so if you're playing Jermaine, this, this might allow you to say, oh, uh, uh, Jermaine, uh, at the offer, uh, I smile. Because, again, I, I want to encourage you to use your character as an I and, and as you're that character. But you can even say, Jermaine smiles and casts her eyes slightly downward as if something else is on her mind. And that could be a cue to your other players to look at insight or things along those lines. And this could... Th this then leads, or it, it sort of tugs at that slightly loose string... That everyone is starting out with, you know, we have this nice kind of tight knit. Everyone's a hero. Well, there's this like one little thing here, and then we go. Whoop. So as heroes, they're relatively bonded, and then they are offered an external force that keeps them bonded, right? So the guild doesn't care if they all sleep in the same house or if they share a hotel room or whatever. Um, they just would need them to show up and you know, and be Captain America, but as the advertising agent, not necessarily the Avenger. Uh, if the guilds are fighting, it would be an interesting idea to have animosity towards others. Uh, yeah, so that that's initially a background thing that can be built in as part of the campaign and conflict. Um, it's really easy, Sayo, if you have humanoid PCs and you tell them, go fight a non-humanoid, because there's a... Uh, there's that removal, right? Oh, well, a goblin is short and green. I'm neither of those things. Um, and so it's a little easier to kill them in kobolds. However, if you need to go and you realize that a very important person who's a very important part of the city uh, ends up being sort of the big the big bad guy, we have mystery and intrigue, but then there's a little bit more of an, uh, a powerful morality to the fact that I'm killing another human. Although we don't have a human in the party, <laughs> but you, you get what I'm saying. Um, so it, it makes it a little bit more visceral. Uh, but we can't build that animosity until we've uh, gotten all of the PCs on board and we've painted a rosy picture, right? Because they're going to get sold a bill of goods. But they're all, you know, naive to this, right? We have the we have the book nerd. We have the two people who, you know, are. Uh, who are, you know, like uh, preppers, uh, you know, living out in the woods. Um, we have the newcomer who's just starting this fledgling templing. So he's like new and innocent with bright eyes to the city. And uh, and then we have Jermaine who knows better, but she can't say anything better because of her disposition and her pact. So everyone, everyone's kind of in a bit of a, a twist or a pinch. Well, say if I sign with Guild A, that naturally puts me not. Yes, I, I would agree with that as a DM. Um, so uh, here, I'll, I'll even type this out here. So offer an external force that keeps them bonded and reveals a bit about the contentious nature of the guilds and uh, faiths. Because if you remember from our, our city building, uh, our city building adventure, it wasn't just the guilds that were fighting, but the faiths were also in on this too. They're all, and that's why I kind of in the summary, it's like, well, it attracts all these firebrand preachers uh, because they have to be able to shout louder than everyone else in this, you know, like this very like open market, like Shanghai style, uh, Hong Kong style um, trade city on the water. 
Um, and so then you learn, okay, here's here's the here's a, like a faith in two guilds that want to come up, and and that they could tell you, well, look, if you join up with us, you have to realize that, uh, you know, the miners guild is uh, is not friends. Like we're friends with the the shipping guild uh, because they love selling our stuff and shipping it down the lake to another location. Um, but the miners are are not good friends with the, I don't know. Um, they're not a, they're not good friends with uh, whatever the 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 guild of faiths or something uh, some interchurch relationship because uh, the this interfaith relationship feels that the miners are exploiting the locals and are you know are are taking the the average man the working man and da- making him downtrodden and you know effectively killing them or something along those lines so we, we can plant those seeds and that's important as DMs this early in the story. Like, they, you might have given them a level if we're doing milestones by now, or even experience. You might have given them a level, no more than two. You want to plant that seed and then let it grow and weave throughout the rest of the of the story. Uh, so then uh, they will make a choice and be sent out. This is going to be... Uh, so here's our ordinary world, right? Minds collapse, you rescue people, your heroes. Uh, this is then we're getting into our call to adventure. The chosen guild needs you to um, needs you to go uh, investigate something. Uh, let's even say that they go. Uh, we'll say that they choose the mining guild. Now, as as a DM, we need to be prepared. Whichever one they take, we should be able to like have three tracks that are close and parallel, and then just have like a flavor track switcher. <laughs> so the events are going to effectively be the same. We just need to dress them up a little differently. So they'll make a choice and be sent out. Um, this uh, is leaving the known world. And this is something then, hey, they're known for going and rescuing people and they're really good at it. And maybe they need to go and investigate what happened. It's so it's not as conclusive. It's an open-ended mystery. Um, we need to know what happened to uh, a group of miners that went down into the area that went underneath the lake because they haven't been under in the area underneath the lake, and they learn that it's a little bit different down there than it is in, in the uh, above ground but under the mountain tunnels. Now, can you work in a refusal here? You probably can because. Your PCs will say, well, look, uh, I mean, in character, hopefully they're winking and nodding, saying, yeah, I get it. We're getting hooked and we're going to go along. But, you know, being true to their character, they might say, well, look, I just started my temple here. I just started my my little chapel or my shrine. And I really, I want to save people, but I got to work on what's happening here. And the the two rangers are going to say, look, we like being out in the woods. Why do we want to do this? So you're going to get a little hem-haw. And as a DM, you're going to have to think of a way to overcome that based on the prompts that the the promptas <laughs> that your players are going to give you. Oh, you reminded me a bit of uh, the relationship between Kugane and the Ruby Confederacy. Oh yeah, so uh, that makes sense to me. If <laughs> if anyone else in here doesn't play fourteen, um, do so, and it'll make sense. <laughs> um, you can almost define it as like necessary evil, that kind of a thing. All right, so they're going to make a choice and be sent out. This is leaving the known world uh, to enter the unknown. And in this case, uh, many of the hero's journeys say you venture into the underworld, quite literally. You're doing that here. Uh, We have a very good template for following this hero's journey. Um, Along the way, uh, do they meet a mentor helper? We might have already done that in so much that they have a guild contact. So some of this can be touch and go or some wedges. Not every wedge is going to be equally proportioned here. And this is going to then have them cross into the threshold. Uh, They cross the threshold into the underworld. And then it's here we can uh, test them through uh, a different kind of combat. or a skill challenge 
Uh, we could even throw in, because they're going into this kind of uh, unknown area, right? The the guild trusts them right now, uh, both because they're... The PCs are very expendable, and the guild doesn't actually care if they die. Uh, so they're sent into this, you know, they're, they're trusted as valuable members of the guild, and they are sent uh, into kind of this dangerous unknown portion to try and recover a research team that has, uh, that has gone down there. Um, they are expendable. And then it's here. Uh, they find the location but only evidence of people being here. There is a clue that will lead to a greater mystery elsewhere. So there's signs that there was combat. There's signs that there was a struggle. Maybe there's smatters of blood or even a corpse or two. Or the remains of a corpse or two. Something might have eaten it. Or they're just, I don't know, weird things, right? We have intelligent people, and they can investigate. Use that. Use investigation. Look at your party, and what skills do they have? Insight, perceptions, uh, sleight of hand, stealth, uh, survival. Which I think SRV was. I put a, a different one in for that. Anyway, so use these skills that they have. Try and, try and open up those doors, especially early on, so that they get comfortable with their characters and the roles that they've wanted to try and play. So here, then, they have the uh, test allies and enemies. Um, they report back, and it's clear in some way that uh, the guild knows more than what they said. And it's at this point the guild says, yeah, you're right, you know, we're testing you, we're going to come clean, you got to believe us, by the way, here's some money. And... Um, Really, uh, this is what's happening, and honestly, the fact that you got this far, uh, you, well, I mean, besides their PCs and have plot armor, uh, well, not I don't want to say plot armor, but they have uh, special PC privileges of, of knowledges that, you know, common folk researchers don't have. Uh, they report back, and it's clear that the guild knows more than what they said. Um, there is a test of wills, morals, or... Um, even combat because once they get back they're going to have to make a decision based on the information that they have in fact they might even be positioned to be uh public heroes at this point in time right they uh they were able to bring peace to one of the mining widows and um and they want to continue that especially because it's being lucrative you have guilds you have money money should not be an issue in this campaign um, which is also another way to keep your characters kind of hooked together, right? Because if they love going on shopping trips for expensive items, then here you go. Um, so there's a test of wills, morals, and even combat. Uh, and around this time, uh, the party resolves to continue with maybe a butt of some kind thrown in. We're only going to do this for you because of this. Or, you know, after this, our contract's over. We're not putting up with this. Or this is too deep. It doesn't even have to be... You don't even have to, like, lift the skirt of corruption to look at the ankle just yet. Um, this is just showing that there's more to, be, to what's happening. And I would argue in this story that we're writing, it's going to be important to have the characters return to the city somewhat frequently so that it's still kind of an urban campaign and... By leaving and coming back, you're showing photographs of another plot that's happening inside the city. So the next time they go out, and um, pardon my far leaning back here. Uh, th so the next time that they, they go out, and maybe they spend a month out in the mountains or in the woods after them. They come back and they notice, hey, something's changed about the city. And then they leave uh, and they go north into the grasslands and they go talk to farmers or something. And they come back after a couple weeks and they say, yeah, something's definitely changed. Look at that. Why is that building not there anymore? Or wasn't, uh, did did the, the, the guilds fight again? Why is there a new, like, supreme guild? Something along those lines. 
Whoa, hey, Miss Squeaky, welcome. We're uh, we're doing some storytelling right now, so uh, lean back in your chair like I was just doing and listen in. We're taking the characters that we randomly rolled up all week and we're throwing them in, into an adventure. And uh, we're doing so using the uh, Heroic Journey as a template. And this is what we have so far. This is staying up on the screen. And uh, and by the way, while you all over... Uh, uh, by the way, uh, Miss Squeaky is over at White Metal Games. Um, I would give her a follow and give White Metal Games a follow because they're the ones who made the very awesome, uh, the very awesome miniatures that I uh, that I've been showing you all week here. Um, so there we go, focused in. Look at that. Well, Delcorn, um, I blame you, but I don't blame you. So there you go. <laughs> Yep, you're doing some work. You're excited to listen. That's all you really have to do, Squeaky. Um, I mean, you can watch on screen, but uh, beyond my my beautiful face, uh, you can just listen to this like it's a talk show, and you should be fine. All right, so we have our city here, and um, uh, you want them to come back because whatever's going on, you can use it to mark uh, to mark the progress of time. You can show how dynamic the city is by saying, "Oh yeah, the." The big, uh, the big ship that was getting loaded up with ore is now set sail. Or in the time you've been gone, one guild has actually uh, become the, the leaders of the city-state over the others. And it's, it's a good way to, to have milestones of time pass. Hey, you know, Shad, technically the, at the end there, the, the cam did focus on... <laughs> Yep, that's true. Uh, oh, by the way, Squeaky, you got to watch out. Uh, Shad shoots lasers out of his one eye, uh, so when he winks, uh, that's him charging up a laser. So you got to be you got to be careful to dodge out of the way of that. But yeah, uh, Squeaky, if you want to link over to White Metal stuff, and if you want to link over to your channel, you're certainly welcome to do so. Uh, you and White Metal are certainly an ally here. So now we've gotten past the test and we have some allies and enemies. You might have made an ally of one of the miners or like the spouse or the child of one of the miners. Um, we have some enemies uh, with not just the overtly hostile guild, uh, but you could even have an internal enemy as well or someone that's willing to test you. Oh, yep, there's the flicker. There's a lot of good stuff. Uh, check that flicker out. They have uh, much better images than what my webcam decides to focus on or not focus on <laughs> and especially because i have a green screen by the way um by the way miss squeaky you're, you'll get a kick out of this right i use a green screen and so look what happens when i put up this uh this orc ranger mini like beyond the fact that it's not wanting to focus it just uh here uh oh, stop looking at my face camera You can see that it's so green, it's like this intense green, that it picks it up and it, it, she becomes, uh, there we go, she becomes translucent. <laughs> okay. So we've now gone through some levels, we've had social interactions, we've had some combat, and we've also had some tests of skills like disarming traps or surviving traps that you might have set off uh, or hazards, natural or otherwise. There's also now a background that something supernatural has taken place because we have this mystery of what happened to these people. Because by all, all accounts, it looks like they're just gone. You know, it's not like there's footprints that were left behind. You know, there's the red herring of the... Uh, there's the red herring of the orcs, right? The orcs that live in the mountains, uh, they're always causing problems, which means there's, they're never causing problems. Um, just as if you're going through a maze or you're going through a dungeon, right, going on the right-hand passage is always the right thing to do, so you go down the left-hand passage instead. That is sage advice. <laughs> a mind flayer did it. Hey, that's that. we're getting into supernatural, and elements of the Underdark do exist here. Because this is going under the lake, it's going under a mountain, uh, there's these weird faces in the mountain, could it be that? Or, in the back of Germain's mind, 
uh, there's this portal, and weird stuff might have been happening ever since that portal opened up, despite her making a pact. It was practicing to be a face hugger for the new Alien movie. <laughs> oh, I actually have a uh, I have a full size uh, egg replica prop um, from the movie. It, it even like lights up in the bottom, and it has a uh, a full sized uh, face hugger that you can take out and hold, and it has a uh, a little sign on it that says uh, "Free hugs" with a smiley face. Uh, so now they spend time researching and investigating. They're making their own decisions and you're allowing the investigators in the group, particularly the not so social, uh, halfling monk to now start piecing things together. Could this be the lore? Like as a character, I could think this, but also in character, could this be the lore that I'm pursuing? Uh, could, could it have something to, uh, to do with that? And uh, this is a, it's not necessarily free time. You can still guide it and offer clues, but you can take them into the mountains, beyond them into the forest and talk to some people there. And so this isn't combative necessarily, unless uh, maybe an orc tribe wants to test this, uh, test their strength. So you don't want a lethal combat. Um, or there's some, you know, random encounters that occur. I, as a DM, don't like random encounters for the sake of random encounters. I like them if they're advancing the story only. Um, they will produce a lead. And I will tell you as a DM, your PCs will give you a lead. And that lead, I mean, it could be a wild goose chase. But I would listen to your PCs because they'll think out loud. And a lot of times they're, they'll have a solid idea. And they might not put things together the way that you did. But can you take their idea and blend it, like pineapple pen it into your own so that they can still feel proud without you saying, oh, you figured it out and patronize them. Um, but for over hurdling or, you know, for overcoming that hurdle, you say, wow, you guys did a good job. Uh, you, you know, you made some solid links and it seems that you're onto something. And this way they feel justified because they, they honestly did come up with that solution themselves. But then they say, yeah, we did it. And we're making progress, and it's bonding. Now, if they're gonna, if they're totally jumping the shark of logic and reason, you, you got to be honest with them. Um, but if they have a solid idea and it doesn't intrinsically change the like the story, roll with it. Be adaptive. Uh, so that they will produce a lead. Uh, this leads to whoop, to the approach. I would recommend here about halfway in to hint at this leading to something major like Germain's uh, pact holder. This is the sub boss right here. I'll, I'll put it here. Sub boss. Not a red herring, not even necessarily directly like he's he's the sign saying, I'm the sub boss of the last guy, but something that will be a solid connection after the fact. Now we have an ordeal. So uh, here they they say, oh, you know what? Uh, we, we did some investigation and one of the tribes of orcs that live on the mountains and tends the face say that on every... Eh, whatever, just make something up. Every uh, 99th full moon, a uh, a presence in the mountains can be felt. And uh, sometimes people go missing or a tunnel will rearrange itself or weird things happen. You know, it, it's bad juju, bad juju magic. Um, and well, hey, shucks, howdy. Uh, it was the 99th full moon. Uh, kind of retroactively looking back and something weird happened. And in this investigation, they picked up that other weird things happened. Now the people in the city, what do they know and care, right? Most of the miners are either like outside of the mountain or home or whatever. And who talks to the, who talks to the, the savage orcs who live in the mountains, who cares about their opinion? Um, so it's something that's been happening, but it's either been passed off as drunken minor tales or who cares about the orcs. Um, 
we have an ordeal to refine the information and gain access to the path that leads to the final conflict. This doesn't mean, again, because they're in the underworld right now, right? They're in that bottom two-thirds of the circle. This doesn't mean they still can't return to the city. And in fact, that this is a good opportunity for them to discover, OMG, there is a secret tunnel, secret tunnel, secret tunnel, uh, that leads from the mines into the heart of the city itself. And I'll tell you, that ain't a naturally made, uh, nor a, an ancient one. This looks to be re, uh, rather recently dug, and it leads into the heart of the city underneath a guild, underneath a big temple, underneath City Hall, something along those lines. Uh, however, to traverse these miles, uh, there's, there's going to be fighting, traps, and especially, I love moral conundrums. Don't do it in a way that your players as human beings are going to get into a fist fight with each other. But when you just throw in the little question of what is the right and wrong thing to do, or, oh, we actually have consequences to our actions, that's a good motivator. Hi, you want to come up? We might have a visitor. Come on. I hear you. Come on. There she is. You all don't get to see her too much. Around this time, she's usually sleeping. A moral conundrum of some kind. <laughs> uh, this is uh, for everyone, if you've not met her before, this is uh, Miss Sophie. Uh, Miss Sophie is a very beautiful tuxedo cat, and she's about 13 years old. Yet she made it all the way up her up here by herself, and she's very spry, and she's very, very lovey. There we go. So we're we're getting the we're getting the deep scratches in right now. She drools, by the way. It's it's absolutely lovely and, and yucky at the same time. <laughs> there we go. So this is their ordeal. Like this is th this is gonna be where we get in a chunk of fighting. Um this is gonna be when some of these maybe supernatural entities, uh these uh denizens of the underdark well so they're aberrations but aberrations aren't necessarily supernatural they're just not natural but we see that now those denizens have been the ones who've been uh summoning in fiends devils demons and how have they been doing that there's not a there's not any sort of like a a liminality area around here there's there's no place where the planes uh you know have uh touched and cracked between each other well, it so happens that actually there is, and all of a sudden now Jermaine's uh, Jermaine's uh, character, well, like the player as the character, is starting to go. Um, so yeah, as part of this ordeal, I may have something I need to tell you. Kitties who drool are the best. <laughs> Yeah, but, you know, if they drool on your keyboard or something because you're scratching their head and, and going from there. She loves having her head touched. Like, if I just do this and she can rest her head in my hand, it's... She's purring. She, it, it's lovely. She she just loves it. Uh, the party fights through the ordeal, overcomes the sub-boss... And is rewarded for the efforts in a genuine fashion. So, like, we're oh, genuine fascio. Um, we're talking like a big treasure parcel, maybe some magic items, and also reputation. 
reputation is something that a lot of DMs may overlook because it's not physical goods. Having a good name in a city, especially one that you are an active citizen in or around, is very important. And even to Falco's player, because Falco's playing the, oh, boo, hiss, cities, he sees now the people of the city care about their city. They care that they're even willing to fight against this unnatural influence that's starting to take over, right? Because after the ordeal, they visit the city. Oh, shoot, it looks like some demons broke out and have been attacking people. What do we do? Well, demons are more unnatural than just digging up stones and stacking them for buildings. Um, so, at least for now, Falco's still on board with this. And he sees that they're coming together and there is community and, and it's starting to break through to him as a character and, and change him. And we've also had a breakthrough with Jermaine, who's finally confessed this deep, dark secret. That's two of our five. Um, and this is also allowing, uh, this is allowing for, um, this is also allowing for Rin to feel pride. Yes. I, you know, I've, I've sort of self banished, uh, I've been self-banished from the city for so long. Here I am. I'm fighting for it. This is what I want. My town or city is my home. I'm going to fight to defend it. She, you know, her patriotic blood is stirring. We're a little over halfway and they've been through stuff. They've, they've, they're, you know, they've leveled up several times together. Um, and maybe this flaw of hers that she'll never fully trust anyone. Well, you know what? That trust was kind of shattered, especially with her friend Jermaine. But with that confession and seeing how Jermaine actually like just breaks down and uh, and it, it tore her apart. That's a bonding moment right there. <laughs> uh, Caboose says, My little boy used to drool in my hand, then I found out I was very allergic to his drool. Hands that itch like crazy for hours. It was not nice. Uh, is, uh, is is your little... Uh, are, are you talking about a, a kitty or a doggo that you have there, Caboose? Or are you talking about having a son and you're allergic to your son drooling on you? <laughs> Uh, so here's our reward, notoriety, items, um, money, significant reputation among people that you might favor to spend time with in some capacity. A kid, ah, kid, a, okay. Uh, by the way, Caboose, if you caught it, I used kid a, and I also used litter in the backstory for the map. I took that as a personal challenge and dang it, it works. <laughs> If I had a drooling son, I would send him to exile. <laughs> oh, this is why I like you guys so much. <laughs> uh, okay, so they've defeated the sub boss. Th this could have even taken them into um, into this parallel realm uh, through. Uh, they, they, they took the tunnel. They found the gate. It's under the city. So it's, yeah, it's in the city, but it's not really because it's in like the nega city or something like that. Uh, they fire through their deal, overcome, rewarded. Um, this happens in the other dimension or some modified hidden away area of the city. Then we hit, we have the road back. Uh, Road back, return with riches as supposed heroes. Resurface. And this could be below the city. This could be from the mines. Heck, this could have even been out in the woods and they just crossed over the mountains again. Uh, resurface to find that uh, the city is in a dire state due to the actual bosses last gambit to assert itself over the region at last after 10,000 years I'm free now make my monster grow <laughs> so here they are oh yeah we beat the sub boss we got all the treasures and what happened to the city why is everything on fire? Which is even more impressive because everything here is made of stone. Why is the stone burning? <laughs> uh, so, moment of tension. Oop. Moment of tension. 
feelings of loss. Backed into a corner of helplessness. This then leads to a rally of some kind. This is them saying, yeah, you know what? we, we got to get our stuff together. We have these treasures. Let's use them. We've made these allies. Or even we've made enemies that we can make into allies. Because let's say that you've had this subplot going of an antagonist from the, the initial uh, guild that didn't like their affiliation. They go to him and say, look, we don't like you. You don't like us. Or heck, maybe they, they've even detached themselves from that, that old bond. Say, look, I don't care if you like this other guild or not. Do you want to even have a guild? If you do, come with me if you want to live. Take my hand, do it now. Yeah, <laughs> 10,000 years. I isn't that what Rita Repulsa said when she came out of the cauldron at the uh, at during uh, the Power Rangers intro? Or was it only like 1,000 or something like that? Uh, so anyway, they have a rally. Um, enemies are friends or... Enemies are still enemies. If you want to get in one last fight and like to really like bolster the party's uh, resolve, you know, you have then you have this very irrational person who says, yeah, you know what? The sky's burning. Well, so what? You know, some men just want to watch the world burn. Yeah, ha, ha. <laughs> yeah, ha, ha. you found me. And then, you know, you found the assassin and he jumps out and he tries to kill you. Uh, on, he's just not giving you a Korax seed. Uh, so enemies are friends, or enemies are still enemies, and attack at the worst possible moment. Because is there ever really a good time to be attacked? Overcome the distraction. Head for the last boss. Using generic terms. Rita had been sealed in her dumpster for nearly 10,000 years before it found its way back to the moon. <laughs> so, here we go. The last boss, you know, it's been investigated or you found some clues. This is, um, this is Bombada's moment, right? Because he, he studies demon anatomy. And, uh... He, he's providing this way. Everyone's coming forward. You know, the rangers are on board. Even the one who hates the city wants to step up and save the city. And, uh, you know, then you have this cleric who suddenly is bringing light to the light to the dark city that the demon is casting over. Um, and you got this, like, this slow motion, you know, like, this, you know, BA, like, astronaut walk to the rocket. You know, all five members of the party are walking down Main Street. Uh, you know, you as the DM should be playing music in the background. Um, that reminds me, am I playing music in the background? There we go. Here's some lovely, uh, here's some lovely docs. Actually, no, 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 We're going to do this. Okay. So, you know, they're, they're, they're the BAs, you know, the BSDs and, uh, yeah, they're walking up, and then there's the monologuing demon. Oh, you did this, and Jermaine, you're the first that I made my contract with. Would you betray your master? Will face the punishment, and he clenches his fist, and she goes, "Aye." But something happens, right? This is where uh, Bombasta can try and sever the contract uh, by finding a loophole, or he concocted something, or the others step up and help her. So she's kind of spotlighted and taken out temporarily uh, only to be put back in because of the rallying and the teamwork around everyone I never noticed it was a dumpster I was too distracted by wanting to be Tommy or Jason <laughs> oh Green Ranger not okay all right I, I can respect that <laughs> mm, pardon So then we have our last fight. Um, everything is on the table, right? Secrets have been confessed. Weaknesses. You know, we have Falco says, Guys, I'm sorry. I, My only regret is that I took Khan as my dump stat for some reason. <laughs> I'm so ashamed. Who does that? Who puts an 8 in their Khan? I do! 
Uh, Bubonic says, I'm way too old for Power Rangers. I'm more of a middle to late 80s cartoons. Ah, okay. So we're talking like Ghostbusters, real Ghostbusters stuff, or... <laughs> Then we have victory with a W because that means you win and you have victory. <laughs> you have uh, victory. You've overcome the demon, if only for now. And <laughs> um, this is the return, right? Uh, or So like the, the atonement, uh, this is the atonement here. Everything's on the table, right? Um... I, I can tell you an atonement story, and I'll do so in segment three. Uh, so it won't get recorded for YouTube, but I'll tell you a really good atonement uh, session that I had. So then we have uh, victory. This is the return, right? So now they return. They might not have united the guilds, but the guilds, if nothing else, out of self-reliance, are going to say, look, let's all put these people up on some kind of a pedestal. That way, we're not fighting amongst each other. It's sort of their responsibility, and we can use them. Because, again, look, guilds, they're interested in themselves, and by that I mean money. Um, yeah, I'm saying this as an evil store owner that makes money. Um, <laughs> uh, though they return, and as you can see, the atonement, right? We're, we're, we're coming back out of this like supernatural suppression... Uh, th lies and misinformation. Everything's on the table with eleven. We've returned. We've returned back. The city might be in a crumbled, uh, a crumbled ruin. Uh, however, it's the city that everyone knows. And now uh, we return. We rebuild. And this, if you don't want to say the campaign, this module that can take you, you know, there's. We could probably find about. I say we could find about 10 milestones in this. So we could have this be a 10 level module if you don't want to make this a campaign itself is fine. And then now they're in positions of power. If they started around level four, cause uh, the cleric was the baby at level four, they're level 14. Um, we can fast forward a couple years. There's all sorts of things that we can do. And finally uh, the world that they now know again, they've been responsible for rebuilding. They have some influence in, um, is now threatened. And is this the return of the demon, uh, which is a very good lead because that's going to make everyone clench up uh, and probably tear a hole in the back of their undies when they hear that. Like, oh, it's the demon, he's back, but how? Uh, and then it actually turns out to, I don't know, be the orcs. <laughs> and so now you've had all this time uh, to spend prepping for supernatural stuff and you're these like, you know, you're, you're these like demon hunters. And then the thing that everyone says, you know, it always is, but it never is actually is and then the city comes from under siege by the orcs because uh they they had it with all with the supernatural uh shenanigans and all this other stuff and so meanwhile outside of the city they rallied themselves and uh that's your that's your last few levels to get you to level 20 is you have to you know defend the city or you have to try and broker a peace you can take this in a battle direction you could take this in a social direction uh, however you want to go, you can finish it out, and boom, you've just run a full campaign. And we've just made an entire story, a mod, if not a campaign, or a novel, if you wanted to novelize this, out of five randomly generated uh, characters over the course of four days, and a map that we spent a little under an hour in MS Paint creating. Hashtag just saying! This is why you should always give storytelling a chance and never be afraid to embark on these journeys. L look at what we've been able to do. It's amazing. It's wonderful. Anyone can do it. Do you have an imagination? You may not think it's much of one, but that just means that you can grow your imagination and your mind is probably more flexible than a long beard's like me because I've used my imagination so often I fall into perils of sticking to, like, paths and... You know, I, despite my best intentions of trying to vary something, maybe I fall back into a pattern. You, as a young blood, if you're a young blood, are in a, a better position to be imaginative and creative and to do things that we old folks haven't thought of doing before. Tom and Jerry are gods to me. <laughs> uh, don't you mean Itchy and Scratchy from The Simpsons? <laughs> 
Uh, yes, the first Rita died in uh, in 06. I, I do remember that event happening. I also remember going to the uh, Power Rangers movie, uh, the one with Ivan Ooze, and uh, I think it was Burger King, uh, if Shad's still in here. I think Burger King had a, uh, had a toy at the time that was a morpher, and so uh, my sister and I and a couple friends all went to BK and got dinner, and we all had our morphers, and then we went to go see the, uh, the movie. Well, Squeaky, you know, the, the mechanics, I would argue, are easy because it's 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 a dice roll. Once you figure out the, the uh, like why you roll a die, you roll the die in that circumstance. Many people, I would say more people get caught up in the storytelling because there's no boundaries. It's not scripted like mechanics are. Uh, anything can be anything, anywhere, at any time. And so they can feel lost. So if you have the story portion down... You know, it's like 70% 70, 70 story, 30% mechanics. You have you have the majority of it written. I can sing word for word the theme song from the 80s TMNT cartoon. Yes. Uh, bless your mess, bubonic one. I vaguely remember seeing the first movie. Oh, the original TMNT cartoon was great. Yeah. I remember playing the arcade game, too. Well, and the NES one, but I don't like talking about the first NES TMNT game because it was not good in my opinion but the arcade oh i would go to the skating rink and mind you back in my day skating rinks offered those tan leather skates with four orange wheels two in the front and two in the back none of this in line crap oh uh, all right well anyway <laughs> i'll nostalgia out with you in a second i'm gonna go to my uh my brb screen uh i'm gonna I'm going to drink a little bit more tea, do some stretches, and then we're going to enter the last phase of tonight's broadcast. So thank you all uh, very much for this, and I will BRB.